It's great to see everybody here, and uh, I want to welcome you uh, if you're new, and uh, if I haven't said hi to you, hello. A um, couple of things I want to get into before we have the, the message today. Uh, if you are new, we have uh, these little booklets, uh, Discovering God 2023, and uh, this was the book that we used for our concert of prayer, and uh, you'll want to kind of grab one of these because that's where the notes will be primarily taken from. If you do have a book already, we're on page 18. Uh, today's theme is going to be Discovering God Through Forgiveness. And uh, so we're going to be talking about that. We're going to be in Romans chapter 5 and, and chapter 6. So if you have your Bibles, smartphones, tablets, however you want to do to kind of follow along today, you can do that. Uh, but this book is just a helpful resource to kind of collect all of the thoughts throughout this series. And uh, if you didn't get that, but just have the, the life group questions, generally speaking, we have fill in the blanks on this where it's blanks on one side and questions on the other. Uh, we just have the blank and then the questions. So feel free to use that also if you want to take some notes. Um, and then uh, lastly, before we get into their text today, just a reminder, next Sunday, February 5th, right after service, we'll have a congregational meeting talking about the future plans, okay? Um, all right, so... The, the theme forgiveness is such a valuable and yet can be very delicate um, topic, right? Uh, especially when we're dealing with uh, people's emotions and generally if we're talking about forgiveness, there's been some hurt and pain involved with that. Um, but before we get into that thought of forgiveness, one of the things that I want to really drill down on is this theme of discovering God. We talked about rest Uh, A couple weeks ago, we talked about silence and solitude, and where forgiveness really plays into that is around the idea of, do we want to discover God? Do we want to draw near to God? You know, if something uh, like in our life that we want to do, it's a lot easier to do it if we want to do it or desire to do it than if we have to do it. Can anybody relate to that? (laughs) I think we all can. Uh, You know, we just got back from the dentist uh, a couple weeks ago with our littles, a cavity-free certificate. So we're all excited, cavity-free, yay, you know. And that's like the boost for parents, you know. We're doing a good job at bedtime at least. uh, And we fail a lot of other areas, but bedtime, I guess we got that routine down. And, you know, it was interesting. I was thinking about that. You know, uh, one day, and it really was highlighted to me, one day I was, uh, I was home working on some sermon stuff, and, and it was kind of the middle of the day, Oliver, on his own, decided to go brush his teeth. So I'm like, hey, that's awesome. And so he goes upstairs, and it's like, you know, a minute or so pass, and, and I know he's upstairs brushing his teeth, and all of a sudden I hear this, this, ah! and it's like, oh, what happened? So I'm running upstairs, and, and uh, here it is, right, this scene. I'm seeing this white kind of foamy stuff drooling coming out of his mouth, and he's screaming, ah, and I said, Oliver, what's the matter? And he says, it's spicy, and I'm like, what happened? What's spicy? And he says, the toothpaste. And I was like, what? Like, what do you mean? Well, it turned out he could not find his flavored toothpaste that tastes like gummy bears or something. I don't know. And uh, he has seen me use this minty flavored toothpaste. And so he thought, well, that's just as good. So he put it on and started scrubbing and realized it was not the same, you know. Well, I got to thinking about the want to. If, if uh, you know, parents started out their children using spicy mint toothpaste uh, to teach their kids how to brush their teeth, that probably would not go well later in life. They probably would not enjoy brushing their teeth, right? So there's some thought around having some pretty tasty flavored toothpaste to begin that process, you know? Same thing with, like, gummy vitamins, I mean, let's be honest, who doesn't love a good gummy vitamin, right? I remember when I was a kid growing up, they had little chalky Flintstone vitamins. That was their first attempt at tasty vitamins, which, you know, I don't know if they succeeded or not, but I grew up okay, that was fine. But, you know, they have really, like, gummy bears that are as good as gummy bears, but they're full of vitamins, you know? They even have adult versions of that because it's so tasty. What's that to do? The the whole purpose of that is because it tastes good, so we want to continue to come back and have our vitamins. We want to continue to come back and brush our teeth, those kinds of things. What is our want to in discovering God? Uh, You know, it says in Psalm uh, 34, maybe. Go ahead, help me out there, Matt. It says, taste and see that the Lord is good. 
Oh, the joys of those who take refuge in him. Taste and see that the Lord is good. What is our want to? Are we wanting to connect with God because we know maybe he's all powerful and so we want to tap into that, that power source? Uh, do, do we want to have clarity for our lives and purpose? And you know, maybe we know that being filled with the Holy Spirit, we want to have the fruit of the Spirit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, gentleness, goodness, self-control, right? Those are types of qualities that we want to see in our life. So we want to pursue God and see those things happen. It could be a multitude of reasons why I want to discover more about God, go deeper in our faith, which is what the series is all geared around. But I would argue this morning that perhaps... One of the deepest reasons of tasting and seeing that the Lord is good comes from understanding our forgiveness. That where God is and that he has come to forgive us our sin, we sang about it multiple times this morning, that that is where deep satisfaction and joy, taking refuge in the Lord, actually comes from. Uh, Have you ever tasted... um, the goodness of forgiveness in your life. Maybe there's been, uh, I, know, I know I've tasted it in my marriage. You know, Becky and I have had to ask for forgiveness and be forgiven by each other multiple times as a part of the, the marriage dance. Um, I know many of us have had relationships that have been broken and tattered and we've had to reconcile them and forgiveness has been a big part of that. Maybe some of us even know relationships that are still not yet reconciled, but uh, forgiveness has to be a part of that or else it won't be reconciled. There's a lot of that 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 goes into this idea of forgiveness. I can remember as a child one of the first times that I really embraced or had experienced like a big forgiveness moment was I probably was seven years old and I had gone to the store with my mom. And you know how it is, like, you know, you're you know, seven years old, I don't know how tall you are, right? You're that, that tall, you're, you're, right, you're at the checkout line, and you're right in front of all the impulse purchase things, you know, you got chips and candy and whatever, right, all right there. <clears throat> well, I had a Huffy bike at home that I really wanted to polish up and, and uh, you know, was going to make nice and shiny and look new, and in front of me, right at eye level, was chapstick. Now, to a seven-year-old, chapstick looks an awful lot like wax, kind of tastes like wax a little bit. I don't know, back in the, you know, early, late 80s, 90s, it probably tasted a little bit like wax. But anyway, so I had it in my head that I needed to get some of that for my healthy bike at home. And so what do I do? Hey, mom, can I buy this chapstick? Or can I have this chapstick? She said, no, put it back. So I said, oh, okay. So I put it back in my pocket, right? And we check out, and we, we head home. So, you know, again, seven, I had a little brother, Tim, and so he's in the car seat next to me. And, and on the way home, I just cannot help myself. And I decide to pull out my wax and start waxing the car seat sitting right next to me. And so I get the chapstick, and I'm waxing it, and, I, and I'm all excited because it's going to work on my bike at home, and it's going to be great. And in the rear view, my mom looks, and she says, Darren, what are you doing? <laughs> and I say, Nothing. And she says, Darren, what's in your hand? I say, nothing. And she says, Darren, did you take that chapstick that I told you not to? And I say, no. And what does she do, right? She's in this parental dilemma. Every parent probably has these dilemmas at some point. What do you do in that moment? I mean, it's a chapstick. It's like less than 50 cents or cheaper at that point, right? It's, it's like nothing, you know what I mean? But, but yet you know that your child is stolen. So what do you do? Well, my mom gets an A-plus for her parenting moment. She actually turns around. We're halfway home. She turns around, drives me all the way back to the store. I talk to the manager, and I'm trembling as a seven-year-old. I mean, I don't know what's going to happen. Am I going to prison? Like, seriously. Like, my life is over. And so we're, we're in, the, in the awkward moment, and so the guy comes down the hallway, and I'm, I'm holding this chapstick in my hand, and, and uh, you know, my mom tells, kind of explains, and I have to apologize. I say, I'm so sorry, you know, for stealing this. And the, the manager kind of bends over. He puts his hand on my shoulder, and he says, son, it's okay. I forgive you, but just don't do it again. You know, it, and I remember feeling so relieved, like I wasn't going to prison you know, like, I, I, seven years old, I thought my life was over. Seriously. Like, people go to prison when they steal things. That's what you're drilled in your mind, you know. And, uh, and I remember feeling so free in that moment, so happy that, wow, I can't believe I was forgiven. 
You know, it's interesting because in that moment, I, I mean, ever, not that I'm not going to sit here and stay, I've never like stolen anything before I like, or since after that, but it has always left a huge mark on me. Like it has always been something, like I've sinned in bazillions of different ways, but stealing is one of those I just have never like done a lot of, you know, because I think there was that, that sticky moment. I just never wanted to endure that again. To taste forgiveness that day really help transform something within my little heart. And what I want us to see today is I think the same is true, that when we taste and see the forgiveness of God and we get to experience in a real way that deep love and joy that comes from that relationship, that's a want to, that we want to keep coming back and experiencing that, that we can trust our forgiveness is so deep and genuine and sincere. And so that's where I want to take us um, this morning. We're going to look at Romans chapter 5 and 6, a little bit in each of those. I think Paul is really drilling home some of this idea. So if you have your Bibles, you can turn there. Uh, If you don't, the verses will be on the screen. But here's the, let me give you some context, right? So in the the, the church in Rome, uh, Paul is writing this because there's, there's, uh, you know, some great things happening. Growth in the church is happening. The gospel of Jesus is being spread. People are receiving the grace of Jesus Christ and that he has forgiven their sin. Uh, And and this is an incredible moment, especially when you think about the Romans who crucified Jesus. Now this is the church in Rome exploding of all the people that, that think about uh, Jesus and what he did for their sin, uh, yeah, you better believe this was highlighted for them in a big way. But there were some also some other tensions that were being developed because, yes, the grace of God is there and the assurance of forgiveness is there in Christ, but yet there is a tension of, well, it doesn't really matter what we do then because God's grace is sufficient. We can keep living however we want to live. And Paul's kind of like, well, wait a second, hold on. And so there's this tension of, of I, I kind of wrote out this statement, you know, the two, two sides of this that maybe we deal with even today, the, the freedom and the law, right? Do we walk in grace in, in such a way that, that really it doesn't matter what we do because God's grace is sufficient? But yet how do we also then understand that there is a law, there is a right way, a righteous way of living that Christ has spelled out for us in Scripture, and, but how do we pursue that righteousness in a way that isn't legalism, that isn't like a burden and a yoke that is not ours to actually carry? And this is the tension that Rome is dealing with. This is the tension I think even in today's church we kind of wrestle with. And so we're going we're to talk about that. I think Paul does a really good job addressing this in, um, in the text. And so uh, we begin in verse 18 of chapter 5, and Paul's addressing a, a compare and contrast of Jesus and a guy named Adam. You might remember him, he's in Genesis, right? And, and so he tells us now what happened between uh, the difference between Adam and Jesus. So let's take a look at this, okay? Yes, Adam's one sin uh, brings condemnation to everyone, but Christ's uh, one act of righteousness brings a right relationship with God and new life for everyone. So the compare and contrast, Adam brought sin, Jesus brought a right relationship with God. Verse 19, because one person disobeyed God, many became sinners. But because one other person obeyed God, many will be made righteous. So the compare and contrast is, yes, they both are human. They they both have the opportunity to sin. But the difference is you see highlighted here. Maybe in your Bibles you might kind of underline these words, right? Disobedience and obedience. Uh, one, One brought disobedience. One brought obedience. One broke our relationship with God. One brought a right relationship with God. And I want us to notice those two words because in verse 20, Paul talks about the law. And I want us to think, when we hear the word law, I want us to think obedience. Maybe specifically our obedience. And then I also want you to to think about in the idea of of, uh, grace. Because grace, we find righteousness not through our good deeds, but through Christ's obedience. And that's what he's telling us here. Let's look at verse 20. God's law was given so that all people could see how sinful they were. Now, I want to pause there for a minute, okay? You see these two ideas, the law, 
was given so that way we can see how sinful we are. Now, I don't know about you. i got to illustrate this, okay? When I read this verse, I always think about speeding. Okay, we have a speed limit sign for a reason, and I'm terrible at following them. In fact, you've seen this probably. You see the the posted 45 and then your speed. And this is, I don't, it's like a shaming tactic for the police, you know? You drive along, and all of a sudden, it's, if the faster you go, the more it blinks, right? If you drive by, it'll flash up your speed, maybe 45, say you're going uh, 46, 47, 48, and it'll just kind of flash slowly. But if you're going maybe more than five over, it'll start flashing rapidly. And then if you're going exceedingly fast, it'll say, slow down. You know what I mean? Like, have any of you experienced this? Okay, thank you for being honest. I'm not alone. All at TV High, right over here, kind of getting into the Safeway, the the Espionade area. Like, man, they put up that sign, and I'm always seeing, like, slow down. I'm like, oh, yes, okay, thank you. They put that sign up for me. All right. Um, All right. This is how I view verse 20. It highlights for us that we need to slow down. There's a set speed limit, right? There's a set law in which God has uh, declared for us. And if you want to get very specific, you find that in the Old Testament, particularly in the first five books of the Old uh, Old Testament, and that is God's law, okay? And and so he puts that in place to identify that, okay, here's here's the measure in which we know what a righteous standard is. But there's no way that we can meet that standard, okay? And so he says in verse 1, God's law was given so that, that all people could see how sinful they were. But as people sinned more and more, God's wonderful grace became more abundant. Praise God. So just as sin ruled over all people and brought them to death, now God's wonderful grace rules instead giving us right standing with God and resulting in eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Praise God here, okay? This is huge. This is is the difference. This is the difference maker, right? Adam brought sin. He broke the law. And now we see how sinful we are. Jesus Christ, through his obedience, fulfilled the law. And now the wonderful grace is what we are under, okay? So this is the reality, and then we, we uh, so here's the big takeaway I want for, if you're taking notes, you can kind of write this down. We are all guilty of sin and condemned. That's what the first verses are saying. But we all can be forgiven and become righteous through Christ. It's a big takeaway we get from the end of this chapter 5. And as we get into then chapter 6, I think it's really important to understand because this whole idea of law and obedience, grace, and, and, and uh, 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 the truth really comes out in the next question that Paul asks. He says, what shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? Here's the tension. Right? He said, look, we can keep sinning, and if we sin more, grace abounds all the more. Praise God. But is this any excuse for us to just continue to live any way we want or to live without really being aware of the speed limits that God has put in place for us? He he asked the question, what shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. In other words, absolutely not. Just because God's grace abounds does not give us a free license to live in any particular way we want. We are those who uh, who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Or do you not know? See, he's clarifying this. That that may may sound a little weird. We're those who died to sin. How did we die to sin? Well, he's going to explain that in verse 3. Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father... Right Here's the phrase here, we too may live a new life. Notice something. Paul Paul flips the script. We are so good at getting nitpicky about, is this speeding or not speeding? Is five miles over the speed limit really that bad? Are we going to get a ticket? At what point does it become an issue? Right? We kind of get into this gray area of like, how far can we go without getting in trouble? And Paul's like, oh, hold on, hold on. You're missing the point. 
Yes, the law is there to reveal this. Yes, God's grace is there to to free us. However, it's less about the obedience or disobedience and more about are we living in submission to Christ Jesus and walking in the new life? Amen? Right, this is where he, he, so he he flips the script, he refocuses our attention. And so again, another takeaway here, forgiveness from God through Christ allows for the new life to begin. Because if we're honest with ourselves, that's what he's saying. If we're really going to be nitpicky about obedience or disobedience, we all fall in the disobedient category. Like, I don't think any of us can honestly say we've not done anything wrong. And so we've disobeyed. Maybe some, maybe you could say worse than others, but a sinner is a sinner. We just had a whole series about eating with sinners uh, for 14 weeks in the fall. And so we, we are humbled by that reality. And, and so what I want to do with the rest of our time is just kind of talk through this discovering God through forgiveness. That, that because forgiveness from God through Christ allows for us to begin a new life, how do, how do we engage that? How do we really live in that? Because that's what we really need to get to. And so to, to help us remember this, uh, it's as simple as ABC, all right? So if you're a note taker, maybe this will be helpful for you, ABC. I, I've broken it down for us so we can kind of see this. First A is, is admit we admit we have been disobedient in our lives. I'm going to give you all the ABCs, and then we're going to flesh them out a little bit more. But I see this especially in those, in those first verses, verses 18 through 20 of chapter 5. Right? We've got to admit that we've disobeyed, that there was a law and we broke the speed limits, and that, that there is the reality that we need a Savior to help us because we couldn't obey God's law. And we've got to admit that. The B is believe. We believe in God's wonderful grace through Christ's obedience, not our own good deeds. This is essential. If we think that we're getting to heaven because of what we've done, because of our good deeds, we're missing the mark. All right, that's what I kind of clarify. Jesus paid the price for our sin, and his resurrection revealed his power over sin and death. He gives us new life. We see that in verse 21, right, being really fleshed out there. God's wonderful grace. He put us in right standing through Christ Jesus. And then the C is confess. Publicly confess these truths to God and others in baptism. Romans 6 was talking about this. Through baptism into death. Now this idea of baptism is when we are immersed uh, as believers, uh, in fact, behind me here in this, this cool little art piece behind me is our baptistry. And so we have people baptized. They are immersed into Christ. And that's this, this burial part. We're dying to our old selves, being immersed under the waters. We're being raised up in Christ's resurrection, coming out of the water. So there's this imagery piece to this. And he says, we too may live a new life. It's, it's in this moment of confessing and, and acknowledging Christ as Lord that we get to live Uh, this new life. And so let's break these ABCs down uh, and so we really understand what we're talking about. When we say admit, the question that comes to my mind is why is this so hard? Do you ever find it hard to admit like that when we're wrong? My boys are always telling me, they're always correcting me, Dad, that's not right, you know. And then they're they're, way smarter than I've ever been and that kind of thing. But it's hard when you're, when you're wrong to admit it. So why is that? Why is that like a hard thing to do? And, and I'm going to say there's probably many reasons why we could probably talk about that. But one of the biggest reasons, I think, is fear. We're afraid to admit um, that we've done something wrong, that maybe we've made a wrong or bad choice, especially when we have to admit that we've hurt somebody that we've maybe said something to someone that we shouldn't, maybe acted towards somebody the way that we shouldn't, and to have to admit that is hard because we have to humble ourselves. How will other people view us if I admit this? How will um, other people think less of us? And even in this, to admit that I've done wrong, there's natural consequences to that. Seven-year-old in the van driving with my mom, I, I was caught red-handed with chapstick. No, 
I didn't steal that. No, it wasn't me. I don't know what I'm doing. Because I knew in that moment, I'm caught red-handed. If I admit this, I'm in big trouble. Fear. But what we don't understand when we are not willing to admit these things is that we miss out on the goodness of God. We miss out on the blessing of really being able to understand, man, he, he already knows that we've messed up. He already knows that we're sinful people, and that's why Jesus came. And so when we don't admit it, we just hold on to those burdens. We get bogged down by those things. And we don't actually get to experience and taste the goodness of God through his forgiveness. See, confession, uh, repentance, admitting our wrong is a great gift that he has given us, that we can run back to the Father. And I would even go say, say a little bit step further, not only is it a gift that we personally get to experience, but God actually wants us to use the experience of being forgiven with purpose. That's what 2 Corinthians tells us. For God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting people's sins against them. But look at this. He gave us this wonderful message of reconciliation. So us, those who have embraced the reconciliation that Christ through Christ, the forgiveness of sins, the joy of the Holy Spirit, right? This actually is now a missional purpose that we get to go, and then so we are Christ's ambassadors. We get to be his ambassadors. God is making his appeal through us as forgiven sinners. We speak for Christ when we plead, come back to God, for God made Christ who never sinned to be the offering for our sin so that we could be made right with God through Christ. I don't know if we've really understood the power of of forgiveness, but this is what Paul's getting at. So when we don't admit, when we don't acknowledge these things, man, we're missing out. Because we're not really getting to see and taste how good our God is because we're not actually taking refuge there. Right, so we got to admit, that's what we're talking about here. And then uh, the, the next part is believe. And listen, Jesus paid the price for our sin. He, uh, in his resurrection, revealed his power over sin. He gave us new life. And so what does that mean? When we believe that Christ has done that for us, it changes everything. We, we used to walk in hate. Now we walk in love. We used to walk in the identity that the world labeled us. Maybe it was rich, maybe it was poor, maybe it was um, it, our status of income and having a good career path, our education, family, family function. For some of us, maybe family dysfunction, right? We get labeled, but guess what? In Christ, we have a new identity as a child of God being transformed to a new life. Right? We, we used to walk in, these, in the fleeting happiness. Now we have everlasting joy. We used to walk in anger and hostility. Now we walk in gentleness and self-control. See, the whole thing is changed because of what Christ has done. This is a gift. This is a part of, of, of acknowledging what he has done. So we admit these things, and we believe that Christ has the power to change our lives, to transform us, and that becomes a get-to, not a have-to. We want to begin to live this way. We don't have to live this way. And I think that's the heart of legalism. Legalism says you have to do this. Grace says you get to do this because we're a child of God now. And I think we, as Christians, we kind of get that muddled a little bit in how we really perceive and do life in this way. So we admit these things so that we all fall short of the God's glory. We believe that he has the power to transform our lives and we begin to see that uh, take heart and hold in our lives through repentance and God's grace. And then we want to we wanna confess these things. Right? Can publicly confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. I love how Peter describes uh, baptism as this, uh, it's a public confession, right? Baptism that now saves you also. Not by the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a clear conscience toward God. It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Amen? See, this is so powerful. When we confess this, it's not just like we say a little prayer and, and, okay, thank you, Jesus. 
Right? There's this bold proclamation that we confess, yes, I admit that I'm a sinner and I believe that Jesus Christ is enough to change my life and I want to confess this publicly both before God as a pledge of a clear conscience and before man. And we get to walk in this transformative new life. I love how Charles Spurgeon talks about confession. It doesn't spoil your happiness to confess your sin. The happiness is not in making Uh, The unhappiness, excuse me, is in not making the confession. What is he saying there? He's saying we carry the burden with us. When we're not really confessing our sin, when we're not really walking in the new life, we're not really experiencing the, the joy that he has for us there. And so... All right, baptism is the normative response. If we genuinely admit that we are sinners, that we believe that Christ has the resurrection power to, to free us from our bondage of sin and shame, right, we want to confess this. Baptism is that natural normative response of confession that has been a part of the church since its birth. Look at Acts chapter 2. You know, like, look at how the church responded. Peter's sermon to the, uh, to the Jews on, on Pentecost, and what do they do? 5,000 that day are responding to the gospel and being baptized. Our public response uh, to Jesus, right, being baptized is, is an essential part of our discipleship journey. And so we respond in that right way. And so all of this, right, the ABCs then lead us to this last thought and then we'll be done, is that, that if we have been united with him in his death, we will Certainly, if you have your Bibles there, underline this word, it's powerful. We will certainly also be united with him in our resurrection like his. Because anyone who has died has been set free from sin. Man, this is so good. This is rich. And I want us to underline the certainty piece. Because here's here's a big takeaway I want us to get. In Christ, there is assurance of forgiveness. Listen, we are really good at guilting ourselves. Satan is really good at getting in into our thought pattern and make us think that we're not really forgiven. We haven't been good enough. We have fallen so short of God's glory. There's no way that he could forgive us. But listen, where sin abounds, grace abounds all the more. Amen? And so here we are, you know, wrestling with these things. And, but yet, listen, we need assurance that Christ is enough. His obedience was enough, not ours. So in Christ there is assurance. And I want to just share with you, I'm going to kind of riddle off these verses because if you don't believe that one verse, there's a multitude that we can turn to. Uh, like in John 12, Jesus says, I did not come to judge the world but to save it. Colossians 2.14, he canceled the record of the charges against us and took away by nailing it to the cross. That's the whole point of the cross. We just sang about that for communion. Ephesians 1, he is so rich in kindness and grace that he purchased our freedom with the blood of his son and forgave our sins. What about this one? As as the sinner hanging on the cross, he's repentant and, and Jesus turns to him and says, assuredly, certainly, guaranteeingly, I say to you today, you will be with me in paradise. What about this one? Hebrews 5, having seen, uh, having been perfected, he became the author of eternal salvation to all who would obey him. Listen, in Christ, there is this promise of forgiveness. There is assurance of forgiveness. We don't have to keep second guessing this thing. And So we talk about discovering God. We talk about deepening our faith and knowledge and understanding and the calling that he may have on our lives. And being secure in our forgiveness is the gateway of communion with God. So we can spend time resting. We can spend time in our silence and solitude as we've been talking about the last few weeks. But church, if we are not secure in this, These other spiritual disciplines are not going to take effect. We're not going to be able to taste and see that the Lord is good and be able to take refuge in him. And so I don't know where you are today, if that's something that you've ever considered or thought about, or or I'm hoping that maybe for some of us this is kind of a basic review. But for so many of us, I hope and I pray that this would touch our hearts 
that we would be moved in such a way that we would admit, believe, and confess Christ as Lord. And so that's what I want to do this morning. I want to lead us in a time of prayer. If, if you do understand that you have fallen short of God's glory, that you do believe that Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior of your life, and you want to confess that today, come forward. Let, let's talk. I'll be sitting right here. And maybe for some of you, you've been wrestling with this idea of grace and truth and obedience and disobedience. And how does it really play out on my Christian walk? I hope that today maybe there can be some clarity and some, some room to breathe. If you've been maybe more on the legalistic side, beating yourself, feeling guilty, feeling shameful. Would we be able to together experience this incredible gospel truth together? Let's pray. God in heaven, I want to thank you for this morning that we get to breathe deep that forgiveness. Father God, you, you desire a relationship with us that is so deep and profound that we get to commune with you every moment of every day. Lord, and in your word you have articulated clearly for us this delicate balance of grace and truth, and yet really what we're talking about is your transformation in our lives. And God, I pray that today there would be some encouragement given. Lord, I pray that today, if maybe there are people that need to hear this truth, Lord, would they be able to receive that? So God, I just want to lead us together, Lord. We just humbly admit that we fall short of your glory that we know we're sinners, we, we have made bad choices, we've done and hurt uh, people and done bad things. And God, you know it all. And so we, we, we admit that to you. And Father God, I pray that you would help our belief because we believe that you have the power and authority to not just forgive us our sin, but actually use that forgiveness story to impact those around us. So, Father God, we believe that you are Lord and Savior. And, God, this morning we confess that truth. Lord, we confess that we need you and that we desire you. And, and Lord, I pray that forgiveness would be something that we get to experience even in this moment together. Lord, as we sing this song, we, we confess these truths before you. And Lord, I pray if anyone here needs to respond in that normative response of baptism, God, I pray that they would today maybe even see that opportunity. Lord, thank you for Jesus. Thank you for your love and grace. And I pray that we'd be edified and be able to honor you with our lives today. So glad you joined us online this week. Uh, before you turn off the service today, I just want to let you know a few things. One is I hope that today's message has met a felt need for you. And perhaps you're ready to take your next steps of faith and following Christ. We are here to help you do that. Or maybe you're on the other end of that spectrum and need some encouragement. We're in the season of winter and, and it can be very hard and even lonely at times. And again, I want you to know we are here for you, okay? Now, by filling out the prayer request form in the link below, you can let us know how we can come alongside you and be an encouragement. Perhaps you're already a believer and maybe you're new to the online service or maybe just to our local Hillsboro community. For you, I want to say welcome. I would love to get coffee or connect and uh, just get some lunch sometime. Or maybe if you want to join us for an in-person gathering at 1030 on Sunday mornings, that would be great too. Um, you can also like our Facebook page, you can subscribe to our YouTube channel, uh, or even check out our website to see what's happening around here. Doing this will help you find ways to engage through giving, joining a life group. We have move weeks uh, periodically that help with outreach events. There's all kinds of things that you can do. So all these things help us focus on our efforts with the vision that we have of seeing people's hope restored in the Pacific Northwest. Well, I hope 2023 will be an exciting and fulfilling year for you and your family. God bless you. We hope to see you next week.